following subject matter is real and only intended for mature audiences. Discretion is advised. People are dead after deputies say a man went on a shooting rampage. I knew a week before she died, I was going to kill her. I can tell you the scene out there is absolutely horrific. Nobody knows where this individual may strike next. This is 10 Minute Murder. Welcome to 10 Minute Murder. Brief and bingeable true crime. My name is Joe. I'm the host. And thanks for joining today. Spooky season continues. But briefly, let me push pause on spooky season so I can explain something from the last episode. And I can't believe I have to explain this. I thought you guys were cool. But I've been inundated. And inundated feels like a word I just made up. I don't think I made that up. I'm going to say it again, but with I'm going to say it with my chest. Some confidence. And if I made it up, then I made it up. I don't think I did. I've been inundated with emails about something I said at the end of the previous episode. I said, submitted for the approval of the Midnight Society. And I didn't mean to say it necessarily. It just kind of came out and I didn't edit that part out. So to answer the questions of many of you that sent me emails, no, that's not a veiled signal that I'm worshiping Satan. I'm still Team Jesus. That line is from Are You Afraid of the Dark? The show that used to come on in the 90s on Nickelodeon. And I can't believe I'm having to explain this. The Midnight Society, those were the kids that got together in the woods and they told spooky stories. So now we can unpause. Back to spooky season. If you are brand new to 10 Minute Murder, that's a weird introduction, and I'm sorry you had to go through that. When you listen to today's episode, if you find that you enjoy it, I hope you'll stick around and become a subscriber. All you have to do is press the subscribe button. It's pretty simple. Also connect with 10 Minute Murder on social media. The links are in the show notes of this episode. Or you can just go to the search bar within Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, type in 10 Minute Murder, and it'll pop right up. Corpus delecti is a Latin term from the Western legal theory that literally means body of the crime. It's also a term that I most likely mispronounced just now. This principle requires proof that a crime took place before an individual can be charged with that crime. So when it comes to homicide, the body is most often the most crucial piece of evidence that helps to make the conviction possible. So, what happens if there is no body? In England, the view of no body, no murder persisted for centuries after three individuals were hanged for the death of another man in 1660. But two years later, the man in question appeared alive and well. However, even though this incident was unfortunate, the idea that rightful conviction could not happen without a body was false. You just need to make sure all other evidence is overwhelming, like in the case of Hella Crafts. Helen Nielsen was a Danish flight attendant born on July 4, 1947, in Denmark. She was described as a vibrant, outgoing child who enjoyed studying, which already is a little bit sus. For Hella, it was easy to make new friends because of her radiant personality, a feature that would follow her all the way through adulthood. Hella also had a remarkable ability to understand and learn new languages. She spoke both French and English in addition to her mother tongue and understood German. Norwegian, and Swedish. Hella's language skills proved to be very useful for her career. In 1969, Hella was training for her job as an air stewardess for Pan American in Florida when she met her husband-to-be, a scruffy-looking airline pilot named Richard Crafts. Richard was not exactly a stereotypical pilot, as he stood just 5'8", with a medium frame, looking pretty ordinary. But there was something to him, and it always seemed like Richard was never without a lady. He almost exclusively dated stewardesses, so it was no surprise when Richard quickly became interested in a new beautiful flight attendant with high cheekbones, long blonde hair, a trim figure, and a warm, engaging smile. Hella. From the start, the two's relationship was pretty stormy. First of all, Richard was allegedly already engaged to someone else, but it didn't seem to bother him or Hella. For the next few years, they would go on and off with regular fights even in public, and still always found their way back together. While Hella seemed happy with Richard despite their disagreements, her friends sensed there was something wrong with him. But at this point, nobody was really able to pinpoint what it was. Hella and Richard eventually got married in 1975, just after they found out they were expecting their first child. While it is quite normal, not necessarily in a good way, for a couple to get married because of a baby, 
Richard's comments about the situation were not what you would expect to hear from a father to be. He said, quote, Hella was pregnant at the time we were married. She knew she was pregnant. It was far too advanced for a doctor to perform an abortion, and we decided to get married. How romantic. I added that last part. He didn't say that. Still, the following year, the family moved to a ranch home in the city of Newtown, Connecticut. Over the next few years, Hella had two more children. While Richard's salary was more than enough to support the family, Hella decided to continue working as a flight attendant. And so, she hired an au pair, 19-year-old Don Marie Thomas, to take care of the children. After all, the Crafts earned over $125,000 a year together, which would be over $400,000 a year today. So they were able to live relatively comfortably, and of course, Richard was able to spend money on his favorite hobby, guns. To mention a few, Richard owned several shotguns, dozens of handguns, including a 9mm, 44 caliber, 357, high-powered rifles, crossbows, hand grenades, and thousands of rounds of ammunition. Okay, so that was a little more than a few. Richard spent hours each week taking care of his collection, but what he did not take care of was his marriage. Often, Richard would just disappear for days from the family home and would never say where he was going. Instead, he would just simply pack his bags and leave. Hella could only guess if Richard was away for work, a gun show, or seeing other women. It was also clear that Richard was not just abusing his wife psychologically. From early on, Hella could be seen with bruises on her face, making everybody know that her husband had a violent side. Unsurprisingly, Hella openly spoke about divorce with her friends. Most likely, she tolerated Richard's infidelity and abuse for the sake of her children. But there is a limit for everybody. For Hella, that limit was reached in 1986 after discovering that her husband had once again been having an affair behind her back. And so Hella retained a divorce attorney and also hired a private detective named Keith Mayo, a former Connecticut cop who quickly provided photographic evidence of Richard's affair. As a result, Hella was finally sure that her marriage was over. On November 18, 1986, Hella landed in New York after returning from Frankfurt, Germany. She was dropped off at home by a friend between 6.30 p.m. and 7 p.m. It's believed that evening, Hella broke the news to Richard in hopes of taking the first step toward her new life. Hella was sure her and her children were going to be just fine. They just needed a fresh start. The following day, Richard woke up the nanny and the children early in the morning and drove them to his sister's house because the power had gone out due to an unusually severe winter storm. But for some reason, Hella was not in the car with them. Actually, she was nowhere to be seen. Understandably, the children were asking Richard where their mother was. The only answer they got was that Hella would meet them later. But that never happened. Hella's absence was noticed a few days later as she did not show up for her next flight assignment and she had not notified Pan American that she would be missing her shift. So the company called Richard, and he told them that Hella had gone to Denmark to look after her mother who had fallen ill. But he also told others asking about Hella that she had gone on a vacation with a friend to Florida or the Canary Islands. And if that's not a red flag, nothing is. Hella's friends were not having it, and so they contacted her attorney, who called the private investigator Keith Mayo, saying Hella had told her something worrying. During their last meeting, Hella had said, if anything ever happens to me, don't think it was an accident. And you can be pretty sure that nobody who knew Hella and her husband thought that Richard did not have something to do with Hella's disappearance. One more fun fact about Richard, he was not just a pilot, but also a part-time cop. And being a part-time cop, you'd think he'd know to report someone that's missing, but he didn't do that. And he kept changing his story over and over again. It's not looking good, Richard. This man even took a polygraph exam and passed so perfectly that his lack of emotion actually raised more suspicion about him. However, it was not until the family's nanny, Dawn, told about something strange she had noticed the morning of Hella's disappearance when the investigators knew something really bad had happened. According to her, there had been a dark stain on a rug in the master bedroom, and Richard had removed part of the carpet quickly afterward. If it was an innocent stain, why did he feel the need to cut it out and destroy it completely? Investigators also found out Richard had made some weird purchases around the time of his wife's disappearance. Those included a freezer, bed sheets, and a comforter, all of which were now missing. However, the most disturbing of purchases were a chainsaw and a rental wood chipper. 
A snowplow driver, Joseph Hines, came forward and reported that he had seen a wood chipper on the bridge running over the Houstonic River around 3.30 a.m. on November 20th, two days after Hella was last seen. One hour later, Joseph saw the same wood chipper on River Road. And who needs to use a wood chipper in the middle of the night unless you're up to something shady? Richard Crafts, apparently. The police hurried to Lake Zoar to organize a massive search. Firstly, they just found some wood chips under layers of dead leaves, which you would expect. But as soon as strands of blonde hair started to appear, everybody's first fear came true. In the end, investigators found 69 slivers of human bone, five droplets of human blood, two teeth, a truncated piece of a human skull, three ounces of human tissue, a portion of a human finger, one fingernail, and one portion of a toenail. Hella Crafts had been found. Well, at least pieces of her. Divers also searched the Houstonic River and found a chainsaw with blonde hairs and fibers attached to the chain. Through some work, investigators were able to reveal the scratched-off serial number, which read 5921616. The number matched the warranty card that Richard had sent in. Of course, it was the husband, which is probably what you were saying out loud nine minutes ago. Authorities suspected that it all started with Richard bludgeoning Hella in their bedroom, most likely after she broke the news about their divorce. Richard then froze her body in the large freezer so that he could dismember it with a chainsaw without a huge mess. And then, while Richard told his friends he'd used the wood chipper to get rid of some branches, he actually used it to get rid of Hella's body. Richard had thought that he committed the perfect crime. No body, no case. Well, things did not go how Richard planned. On January 11th, around 9 p.m., law enforcement came to his door with an arrest warrant. And what did Richard do? He said, quote, I'm tired. I'll take care of it in the morning. And that's not the way the police work, so they took him into custody. Richard's murder trial began in May of 1988. While there was not really a body, there was a ton of other evidence against him. And Richard's only defense was an argument that Hella had simply run away. You would think everything was clear as day and there would not be any issues to convict. But no. For reasons unknown, one juror voted to acquit Richard. I can't really understand that logic. Nevertheless, Richard was finally found guilty of murder in his second trial, as he should have. Richard Kraft's conviction was the first one ever in Connecticut's history where there was no body. Richard was sentenced to serve 50 years in prison. And as you can guess, he has never admitted to his involvement in Hella's murder. Nowadays, Richard Crafts is a free man, as he was released in early 2020 at the age of 82. And the real question is the only one that remains. How can a husband kill his wife and mother of his children, freeze her body, dismember it with a chainsaw, put her through a wood chipper, rather than just pick up a pen and sign divorce papers? That's today's 10-minute murder, brief and bingeable true crime. Thanks for joining today. And be sure, if you are not subscribed to this podcast that you're listening to right now, subscribe. You won't miss any episodes in the future, and I may kiss you directly on the mouth. I probably won't do that, but you never know. Could happen. Also, if you have any friends that may enjoy a brief true crime story like this one, be sure to share 10-minute murder with them. Connect on social media. The links are in the show notes of this episode or just type 10 Minute Murder into the search bar on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. And lastly, if you enjoy 10 Minute Murder and are listening on Apple Podcasts, it would be super kind of you to leave a five-star rating and review. Thank you for listening to 10 Minute Murder. Have a good night.